It is true. You are right. Marco Dane was blackmailing me. Judith Light first became a star on the daytime drama One Life to Live. Her moving performances as Karen Wolick, a prostitute by day and doctor's wife by night, earned her two Emmys and a place in the annals of television history. Eventually, Judith went from daytime to primetime. She starred as Angela Bauer on the top-rated sitcom Who's the Boss? Angela was the endearing single mother with a career and a live-in male housekeeper. You'll have to wash those by hand. You don't really want me to wash your skivvies, do you? <laughs> Judith has always played characters which reach beyond the television screen and touch people's hearts. Her gift became apparent early in life. Born in Trenton, New Jersey, February 9, 1949, Judith was the adored only child of Sue and Sidney Light. Her mother was a homemaker and her dad was a salesman for an industrial food company. A precocious little girl, Judith memorized the poems her mother read to her nightly. It soon became clear that Judith was a little girl with a lot of talent. My father was sitting in the living room, and then there was the dining room area, and I was performing. It was the night before Christmas, and I remember finishing the piece, um, and to all a good night, and I look at my father, and he has tears streaming down his face, and I ran to him, and he just held me. My feeling was so overwhelming, like I wanted to grab her and eat her up. She was just so cute. And I remember having the thought, oh, I want to do this forever. I want to be an actress. And I can remember her first narrative report card, and the kindergarten teacher wrote, Judy shows unusual dramatic ability, and the, and the children enjoy her reciting poetry. And then in fourth grade, they had a um, Christmas play and Judith played the poor little girl and she cried real tears and the letters from the different classes were all said we love the part where you cried real tears even though money was tight Judith's parents nurtured her budding talents with ballet tap dance piano speech and voice lessons when she got parts in community theater, sometimes as much as 40 miles from her home, her dad made sure Judith was there, despite the fact that he only got a few hours of sleep on those nights. It was 45 minutes from our house, and my father, who had to get up at 3 o'clock in the morning to go to work, would drive me to the theater, and I was embarrassed for him to see me practicing. I wanted them to see me in the full-blown performance, and so my father would sleep in the car even in the winter, and wait for me, and then drive me back home. And they were extremely dedicated. They still are. Cider. Usually kids don't know when they're so young what they want to do, and what their goal is, and where they're going in life. And so I was different than a lot of the other kids. And I think I was too dramatic and sort of, I put people off. And so I didn't have a lot of friends. I was alone and so I would go up into my room and I would memorize Shakespeare and I would read poetry and perform in front of the mirror. Judith's first real turning point came at the age of 12 when her parents sent her to a special summer camp in Pennsylvania. It was a, a performing arts school for the summer. And I felt like, oh my God, here are my people. Here are all these people that have also felt outside and we're gonna do plays and we're gonna do ballet and we're gonna, we're gonna study and we're gonna talk to each other. And all of a sudden I felt like a different person. I felt like there, I didn't just get dropped from another planet. There is a place where those of us who came from the other planet got to get together. As an only child, Judith was used to and expected to be the center of attention. I was a spoiled child. When I did the play, The Diary of Anne Frank at the Burlington County Footlighters, I remember I took off my costume and I dropped it on the floor, as I did every night. And the director came up to me, a wonderful man named Ferenc Schubert, and Ferenc said to me, those are your clothes on the floor. I said, yes, I, the costume person will pick them up. And I was maybe all of 14 years old, and he said, oh, I don't think so. And he took all the clothes and all the costumes of everybody else in the entire plane, he threw them on the floor, and he said, you will pick all of these up, including your own. So I 
yes, I, I was spoiled. Seeking a good education for Judith, her parents sent her to St. Mary's Hall in Burlington, New Jersey. But her sense of being an outsider was intensified again. She was one of only six Jewish girls in an all-Episcopal high school. We wore chapel veils and uniforms, and I think three of the girls in my graduating class were pregnant when we graduated. And um, it was just, it was a fabulous school. Except for the fact that they wouldn't let me be the Virgin Mary in the Christmas mystery play. That really, really bothered me. I want to say, you don't understand. You know those people, that family, they were Jews. So, I mean, I could be the Virgin Mary. There, Judith met Ruth Strand, a drama teacher who recognized and nurtured her talents. Ruth served as the coach, guiding the talents of her emerging star. They became lifelong friends. In 1966, Judith graduated with a degree in theater arts from St. Mary's Hall. Her senior yearbook was a revealing portrait of Judith's high school career. St. Mary's answer to Sarah Bernhardt. God, that would be right. Sophomore class secretary, I was. My God, I don't remember ever doing anything that had anything to do with, with anything secretarial. I was terrible in typing. Uh, basketball manager. I was the basketball manager, and what I did was I picked up the dirty towels. I, did, I was the basketball manager because I could not play basketball. I just happened to be a little tall, and they thought, oh, this is a good thing. We're going to give her, we're going to put her on the basketball team. And then they said, oh, my God, get her out of here. Just get rid of her. You had to pick a quote. Don't ask me where I got this. It's pretty incredible. Acting is no mere translation or abstraction from life. It is life itself. To follow her dream, Judith applied and was accepted at Carnegie Mellon University, the oldest and one of the most prestigious drama schools in the nation. This program is as rigorous and exacting as theater itself, and they weren't kidding. So I didn't get to really act, uh, really perform for two years. It was a lot of classwork and a lot of crew and building props and sewing costumes, which I am terrible at, and so I had to learn how to do it. Eventually, she made it on stage. Judith did Shakespeare, got parts in avant-garde and traditional plays. She traveled throughout Europe with a USO troupe. Four years later, she graduated with a theater arts degree. She hit the road, honing her craft in repertory theater around the country, Milwaukee, Seattle, and California. Finally, it was time to head for the mecca of theater, Broadway. I remember flying into New York, though, for the first time, knowing that I was moving there. And I looked down from the plane and I said, oh, this is going to be fabulous. This is, the, this is the dream come true. This is going to be great. And I'm going to make it. New York City would put her talent to the test. She had a dream, some experience, and an abundance of spirit. Now, all she needed was a break. The combination of talent, experience, and prestigious play with an internationally famous star. The first play that I did was A Dollhouse with Lee Woolman, and it was on Broadway, which was one of the places I had always set my sights on. And then I worked a lot, uh, and then I didn't work for a while, and that's when things got more difficult for me. I didn't have a lot of money, so I managed to live on $10 a week. And I, I would take the newspaper out of the garbage cans so that I could read the newspaper. I asked my parents for money. And I said, I need this amount to get by. And my father said, we'll give you half that. And I was, I thought, oh my god. And I thought much later, um, after therapy, <laughs> I, I, I realized what a favor he was doing me. He, they wanted to make sure that I was going to be able to do it on my own, that I was going to be able to manage, and that I was going to be able to function. And I think that was terribly important. I appreciate them for that now. I did, certainly didn't then, but I do now. For almost a year, times were tough. The dream seemed to be elusive. When things didn't work out according to the plan that I had had, I dealt with it very badly. I wanted it the way I wanted it, when I wanted it. And life doesn't happen like that. Because there was something very real going on emotionally, but there was also something that was just me being a spoiled brat. So I went to a therapist and I said, I want to get out of the business. I want to do something where I can be of service. And he said, don't do anything about leaving the business yet because something's going to happen within this next week. And well, he wasn't clairvoyant, 
um, that I knew of, but he ended up to be right. And that was how um, I, I left his office, literally went to a phone booth, called my agent. They said, they want to see you as an understudy for one life to live. I said, an understudy on a soap opera? My heart sank. And I said, oh, it's okay, it's just an understudy. But I really needed the money. I don't have to be on camera. So nobody's ever going to see me do it. So I don't have to be really embarrassed. I'll get the money and that'll be great. Didn't turn out like that. You know, unfortunately, there are a lot of ridiculous rumors going around the Jenny, house. please, I really don't want to hear about them. I feel that I, I just blame myself enough for what happened to Larry. The producers saw something special in the new young actress and gave her the part of Karen Wolek a doctor's wife by night and a common hooker by day. But Judith refused to be the stereotypical soap star, both in appearance and performance. This was the first role that would make her a star. She turned what was considered a pathetic, manipulating woman into an empathetic character. But she was warned it wouldn't be easy. People will hate you. They will yell at you on the street. They will be angry at you. You will not be a lovable character, so you just need to know that. And I didn't really know what they were talking about. And I thought, there's a person inside there that needs to have, to have some light shed on her, who she is, why she is the way she is. And that was the way that I always like to work, that there are many layers to human beings. They're not just two-dimensional. And so when I began to explore why she was the way she was, it started to come to life in a whole different way. The audience embraced Karen Wolek and Judith's career took off. Not long afterwards, Judith met Herb Hampshire, a renowned psychologist at a humanitarian convention. Herb would have a profound influence on Judith's work and life. He soon became her friend, later her manager, and occasionally her acting coach. She would say, I'm having trouble with this scene and I don't know why. I think I can tell you why you're having difficulty with this, because uh, this scene requires you to find something in yourself that you are uncomfortable having there. And so this, this character has some unattractive features and unconsciously, I think you're, you're wanting to say, oh no, I can't be that. And, and I said, part of what an actor has to do is to find everything, no matter what it is, inside you. Herb's observation had a dramatic effect. The director came back to her and said, what happened? What, <laughs> what did you do over lunch? Uh, it, it really made a, a huge difference. When we first started to work together, he said, if you cannot view yourself like a bottle of ketchup, like a commodity, he said, I can't work with you. He said, if you're going to be spoiled, I won't work with you. He said, I am not going to pat you on the behind and blow in your ear. He said, he said I can promise you that it won't be easy if we work together, he said, but I can promise you that... <laughs> I can promise you that it will be alive. And I said, I want that. I want that more than anything. What was the name of that hotel? The Wellington. What was that name? Would you speak up? The Wellington Hotel. Thank you, Ed Barnes. Judith Beautiful, created man. a character so powerful, her courtroom revelation yes, became a defining moment in the world of soap operas. I think the reason people are touched by the courtroom scene is that it is a woman literally coming out of the closet about who she is. She is frightened. She is scared. She is a person who, above all else, wants to help her friend. She really wants to have an experience of herself having integrity. And she is bearing everything. According to TV Guide, this riveting courtroom scene was one of the top 100 moments in television history. What do you want from me? You want blood? You want me to say that I'm lower than the lowest piece of scum? You want more filth? You want more slime? You want more names? I'll give you another name. Talbot Huddleston! He was my first John. He was the first in a string of so many men I don't even remember their names. No! No! Are you satisfied? 
Judith's performance galvanized viewers. She got stacks of mail, some from prostitutes who wanted to get off the streets. She suddenly realized that acting could have a direct effect on people's lives. A teacher wrote me a letter and said, um, that she said, I don't remember the little boy's name, but she said he was like six years old. And he, no, he had never spoken. He was autistic. And she said they had the television on in the day room. And he was walking through. The courtroom scene was on. And he looked at the television and he pointed. And he said, cry. And she said, I don't know how to tell you that you changed my life in relation to him and you changed his life. And I read the letter and I said, okay, I can die now. That's enough for me. That's enough. That's, that's it. That's it. That's the gift. There's nothing better than that, I don't think. Except love. <laughs> Judith's career was skyrocketing. In 1980, she was nominated for a Daytime Emmy Award. We were sitting in Rockefeller Plaza, and Sammy Davis Jr., who loved the soaps and was on our show, we'd worked together. Sammy ran over from his table over to our table, and they were about to announce it, and he whispered in my ear, and he said, you're going to win. And I thought the combination of Sammy Davis Jr. and the possibility of winning an Emmy was thrilling. It was wonderful. ladies. I think they're remarkable and I respect their work enormously. The Emmy would change her career and she was about to meet the actor who would change her life. I'm Jill Eikenberry, Judith Light, an intimate portrait. It was 1981. Robert Desiderio was cast opposite Judith on One Life to Live, a role that was meant to last just two weeks. Neither could have known that the chemistry between them would change the show and their lives. I knew I was attracted to her from the very beginning. I had never met a woman like that. It was, I mean, I didn't know her. I didn't ever watch soaps. As I saw him on the set and I thought, I felt like I knew him. I felt like we were connected in some very deep, primal way. She was like those, the European actresses that I love. You know, she just had, she was, Judith was earthy and is earthy and, um, I just passionate. I, I loved working off of that because it was a lot of physicality that we did. And we started working together and we started doing scenes together and they started seeing the chemistry between us and they just started writing to it. You can't deny you love me and then after last night. It was incredible. I, I, I had never been able to open up with another person, let alone another woman before in my life. And, I felt safe enough to be vulnerable and I didn't have to, you know, buy in into all the, you know, the masculine male stuff. And here was somebody who was not competitive with me and somebody who really took joy in what I was doing and what I was about and the places that I wanted to go and the things that I thought about. He was just a, a man and sure of himself and, and challenged me and great to look at. <laughs> After dating for six months, they moved in together. Now their personal and professional lives were in sync. Judith's career successes continued as she won her second Emmy. Winner of two Soapies and a Soap Opera Hall of Fame award, Judith graced the covers of dozens of magazines and even guest hosted Good Morning New York. But it wasn't enough. Judith wanted new challenges and started thinking about leaving the show. I knew 
that there was a deeper level inside of me and I had more to give. With the support of her family and friends, Judith found the courage to leave One Life to Live after five very successful years. It's the sound of our future, kid. They brought me back to finish up her storyline, and our characters ran off together. And we ran off together in life and <laughs> on the soap. Judith had achieved what most people only dream of, love, fame, and success. But there was one secret battle she had been fighting all those years, her weight. When I was really little, I, I wouldn't eat at all. I remember actually the first night, and I don't remember how old I was, that I ate everything on my plate, and I completely cleaned my plate, and I said, oh, Th this is very good. This is a very good experience, and it was a, um, it was an experience that I, that I deeply connected to because I felt like I had accomplished something. Well, that was sort of the bad news <laughs> because it was the turning point for me, continuing to want to clean my plate, and uh, I cleaned my plate probably right up until one life to live, <laughs> and a little bit beyond that actually. Weight had never been a deterrent to her professional success or her personal love life, but it undermined her self-esteem. So Judith went on the diet roller coaster, losing and gaining until she ultimately peaked at 175 pounds. I look at how I looked, and I know that the way I look now and the way I looked then, it, it's two different people. It was a woman who was coming to grips with low self-esteem. So I went to the therapist and he, I said, I want to lose weight. And he said, well, you, don't, you never learned how to eat, and so you have to learn how to eat. And he said, so I want you to go eat. And I became enraged. I was so angry. And I said, that is not supportive. That is not a way to tell a person to, to, to help a person lose weight. And he said, no, you don't understand. He said, you have no permission. He said, you don't understand what's going on in you. He said, I want you to eat. Which Judith did with a vengeance. She went home and ate whatever and whenever she wanted to. I was just in the closet about it. I was eating all the time anyway. I, I was eating half gallons of ice cream at a sitting. I was eating whole cakes, whole cakes and boxes of cookies, but I didn't have any permission. I was in the, it was a secret. It was, I was in the dark about it. And now it was as though there was a light shed on it. So I opened the refrigerator door, and as I was fond of saying, I opened the light went on, and I did 20 minutes. And I just sat there in front of the refrigerator, and I ate everything. And over a period of time, I would go to the refrigerator and I said, okay, I can eat whatever I want. I can eat whatever I want as much as I want. And I remember the day I opened the refrigerator and I said, well, since I can have, have anything that I want, what do I want? And it was a revelation for me. And I said, oh, I'll have a little bit of that and a little bit of that and a little bit of that. And then I was done. And then I started to lose weight. Ultimately, it took two years to lose 50 pounds and keep it off. It was another lifetime goal accomplished. I couldn't believe it, you know, when the first time I met her and she said I used to be fat. And it's like, come on, what do you know from it? But she says, no, no, I used to be fat and I, it was very hard for me to uh, stay this weight. And I exercised and I have to watch when I ate and I said, sister! Losing the weight allowed Judith to reinvent her image. Her manager, Herb, would help refocus her approach to acting and to life. By the early 80s, Judith and Herb Hampshire, her manager, had developed a unique working relationship. He had become an indispensable guide for both her personal life and her career. He comes with me to everything that I do. He's there to support me in every project. And people say, oh God, I wish Herb were with me. I wish I had a Herb to be with me and be on the set. I wish my manager would be on the set. It's like, this isn't party time. I mean. He keeps my feet up against the, the flame all the time so that I'm not selling out on myself because I don't want to be on my deathbed and look back at my life in that moment and say, oh my God, if I had just worked a little harder, thought a little more, given a little bit more, my life would have been so different. Judith was looking for new challenges. So in 1983, she and Robert moved to California. Later, Herb and his companion, Jonathan, who was Judith's financial manager, followed. 
Finally, in October, she had the opportunity to commit to a sitcom pilot. She did, but then Herb convinced her to audition for another sitcom, even though she wouldn't be able to take the job if it were offered. The show was tentatively titled You're the Boss. It was about a woman executive who hires a live-in male housekeeper. I went to the audition, and I walked in, and I met Tony Danza, and we had instant chemistry. And I thought to myself, oh my God, I made a terrible mistake. Judith auditioned with four other women for the part of Angela Bauer to play opposite Tony Danza. Angela, Judith, light. Take one. This is her never-before-seen audition tape, and this is the moment that cinched the deal for Judith. Did you have a bad dream, honey? Hmm? No, I didn't even get to sleep. Oh. The bit was, as they walked out, the girls walked out, and me being who I am, as the actresses, actors walked out, I sort of looked, you know, checked them out. And each one of them went to their, to their uh, mark, sat down, and we did the scene. Well, Judith was the last one. And so as soon as she walked by... I just knew he was going to be looking at me as I walked in front of him. And I just turned around and I looked at him. And she caught me. She turned around and she said, what are you looking at? And I said, gee, I didn't know, you know, just check, you know, I got all blood, blushed and, uh, and um, that was it, chemistry. <laughs> Luckily for Judith, the show she originally committed to didn't work out. She was then free to join the cast of the newly retitled Who's the Boss? her home for the next eight years. Morning. May I help you? Well, if you're Angela Bauer, I'm here to help you. I beg your pardon. I'm Tony Maselli. I'm here about the job. Oh, I'm sorry. There must be a mistake. This job is for a housekeeper. That's me, Mr. Goodmark. <laughs> Judith hit the jackpot again. 30 million people watched as she transformed herself from a soap opera diva to a primetime comedian. There's nothing like working with her. I mean, she's, uh, you know, she's... She's the bravest blonde in, in Hollywood, that's for sure. We had a saying around the show that, uh, I mean, she'd do anything for a laugh. Since I've got carpool, I want you out front of the school at exactly 1.15 because you have a haircut at 1.45. Then we've got to get back here no later than 3.05 because that's when I penciled in to go to the bathroom. I skipped that yesterday. Morning. Morning. I want to tell Angela again. Is there a problem? Well, I sort of wanted scrambled eggs. You want scrambled? <laughs> you got scrambled. She sobbed incessantly for years on that uh, on that on that uh, soap opera, um, and so you know I learned a little bit of that from her, and she learned a little bit of uh, you know how to be the fool. But from me, I think. You're going down the path with my bubble bath. Hi, hi, holy smoke. <laughs> Tony taught me about comedy. He would say things like, we're going to jump off a building today. And I would say, OK. Nothing bothered her. I I'll tell you what, Judith, you're going to hit this trampoline and stuff that ball in a 10-foot basket. OK. Will they laugh? Yeah, don't worry. You know, and she'd do it, you know? And then if they didn't laugh, she'd look at me and do dirty. <laughs> Finally, after eight years, 196 episodes, and millions of laughs, Who's the Boss ended in 1992. The last show on Who's the Boss was the end of an era and a completion. And um, it was important to me also because we'd come through and we'd been successful. And Tony and I were really deeply connected by that time. What are you doing here? Well, I, uh, I heard you were looking for a housekeeper. And I also knew how much I was going to miss him. It's very difficult to say goodbye because you really are saying goodbye. You move on to other things. Sure, we keep in touch. And sure, we, you know, she knows, as I know, that we're both thinking of each other and stuff. But, but that constant, hey, what's happening? How you doing today? What's going on? You miss that. What are your qualifications? <laughs> uh, well, um... You got the job. <laughs> no kidding. Though her professional romantic relationship was ending, her personal romance with Robert was there for the long run. But marriage was not going to be an easy decision for either of them. I'm Jill Eikenberry. 
Robert and Judith first met in New York. Two years later, they moved to California, but they wouldn't make a commitment to marriage until years later. Neither of us had ever been married. Judith did not want to particularly get married. I did. So I pursued it from that point of view, and Herb and Jonathan were very instrumental in helping us facilitate the discussions, what we didn't like about marriage, our preconceived ideas of what it meant, and our fears. I don't remember a specific moment for the proposal. It was a year-long process. So we got married in Aspen, January 1st, 1985. Herb and Jonathan were the only people at the wedding. My mother had just had a very severe um, heart attack. She'd had a, a massive coronary. And I knew that it was going to be very complicated for them to try to help me plan a wedding. So we did it very simply and very quietly. And the guys were there, and that was it. And what was great about it was that the day was truly about us and our relationship and our marriage and what our future was going to be and it wasn't about all the presents we got and it wasn't about gold overlays and pink underlays and what flowers were going to be there and is the dress right and all of that stuff it was very simple and very beautiful Judith's life and career were moving in new directions. She was not afraid to stretch herself, singing, dancing, and playing a wide variety of roles in television movies. Judith lent her considerable talent, energy, and humor to one of the most fun projects I ever did, a TV movie called My Boyfriend's Back, in which Sandy Duncan, Judith, and I played a girl group from the 60s who's called out of retirement for a reunion concert. It turned out to be a fantasy we all shared, and we had a ball. It was just one of 15 films Judith has made. Many of them confronted taboo subjects. There are very few times in your life when you get to feel like you make a difference. Judith's choice of films is a reflection of her human rights commitment. Betrayal of Trust with Judd Hirsch focused on the true story of a woman who exposed the sexual abuse of patients by their psychiatrist. Men Don't Tell with Peter Strauss was the first movie to deal with male spousal abuse. Her movie, A Step Towards Tomorrow, featured Christopher Reeve in his first acting job after his tragic accident. The movie dealt with spinal cord injuries. I choose my projects by what I feel will support people and women to grow, to see something in themselves that will make a difference and that will possibly change their lives. In 1989, a script arrived that would ignite the other passion in Judith's life, activism. The Ryan White story was about the young boy who got AIDS from a blood transfusion. Afraid of catching the disease, his own community turned against him, even banning him from the public school. Ryan's plight galvanized the nation and added a child's face to the gallery of victims of that tragic disease. Best known for Who's the Boss, Judith wasn't the obvious choice to play Jeannie White, Ryan's mother. So Judith researched the role by spending a lot of time with Jeannie. I was so impressed because she actually was very attentive and listened, really listened. She was really, really wanting to know, you know, like what it was like to, to watch Ryan, you know, live with this disease and the, the pain and the agony I think that we went through. came from the school they won't listen they are afraid to take a chance they say it's a communicable disease well what do they want me to do sit around here and do nothing what am i gonna do they don't want you back i think she put her heart into my heart and she put her heart into our family and i think that's a real unique thing to do. We, we didn't have a lot of people feeling that way. You it! No, no, no. Go to hell! Jeannie was very powerful with Ryan. Much of where Ryan comes from comes from Jeannie. This woman who had no exposure to anything in this business or anything at all of this world got herself out there and she became a spokesperson. These are these women that take the world by storm in their simplicity, and I have such admiration for them. What do you want? You know what I want, Mommy! You want to go to school? Yes! I want to go to school! Then you will. 
Damn it. You will. Little did Judith know that working with Ryan would affect her in much the same way. One day on the set, Ryan was talking to somebody and tell us some of the things that happened, and he said, well, somebody spit at me and called me a faggot. And I... It just killed me. It didn't just kill me for Ryan, because he was one of the sweetest souls I ever knew. That wasn't just what it was. It was... It wasn't okay for me about Herb and Jonathan. It wasn't okay for me about this country. Human beings don't really have the right to treat each other like that. Rage. Rage against the dying of From the then on, the battle became Judith's. She was to become a highly visible, vocal, and ceaseless fighter against AIDS and against discrimination of gays and lesbians. She can't be neutral when people are being injured in some way. She's an American who believes that, that America actually should act the way it pretends to be. Judith took up the torch, and in 1993, she spoke before half a million people during the Gay and Lesbian Human Rights March on Washington. This cause is everyone's cause. It is a battle to replace divisiveness with acceptance, condemnation with compassion, rigidity with diversity, and most of all, hatred with love. Thank you all. Middle America looks at her and they respond. She's a woman that's come into their lives all these years on TV. They respect her as a straight woman. And I, it, it, they listen, I think, when she speaks. I think for the gay community, it's nice to know that somebody cares that isn't gay, that doesn't have to care, you know, based on their own survival. For her, it's, um, it's that she wants to and that she thinks it's important. Since 1995, she served on the board of directors for the Gay and Lesbian Center in Los Angeles. It's a place where people can come, where diversity is accepted, discrimination is appalled, and it deals with human rights and the human condition. I think that the greatest thing about Judith Light is that she has a very big heart and it's made of gold. She just is involved and interested and it's always spurred by the fact that she cares. She reminds me of that, remember that Star Trek where they meet this woman that when they're wounded, she hugs them and the, the woman gets the wounds and then she has to rest for a while and then she's better. Well, that's like Judith. <laughs> she's that woman, I think. Judith has devoted her life to her activism, her acting, and her family. But as caring and nurturing as Judith is, she and Robert have made the conscious decision not to have children. I would not be doing what I'm doing right now if I had children. I think it's extremely important, and my desire would be to be home with the child. And every once in a while, I look at it and I say, mm, I don't have that. I see a mother and a daughter having lunch, or... I see them at the ballet together or something like that, and I think, or a mother and her son, and I think, I don't have that. And there is a place in me that misses that. I have a very maternal soul that's in there, and I think it comes through. I think it definitely shows in the work, and they keep giving me moms to play, and so I get to do it that way, too. Today, Judith is working on a new sitcom pilot called The Simple Life that Herb helped create for her. The lead character, Sarah Campbell, is a TV star who tries to teach audiences how to have a charming lifestyle, despite the overwhelming demands of modern life. And we cut! Behind the scenes, in her real life, Judith is a woman fighting tirelessly for causes she believes in. Celebrity is great. I've said this a lot before. Celebrity, you get lots of perks. But the real perk for me comes in having the celebrity to be able to make a difference in the world. Otherwise, it's extremely shallow for me. I just want to be a person that says, stand up and be counted. I'm with you, I want to lend my support. Judith Light, actress, activist, and loving friend. For Intimate Portrait, I'm Jill Eikenberry. In 1999, Judith took on her greatest acting challenge yet. 
She shaved her head to play a college professor struggling with ovarian cancer in the Pulitzer Prize winning Broadway play, Wit. The part earned her rave reviews. Plus, Judith says, I've discovered that how I look is not a function of anything as ephemeral as my hair. Bravo, Judith. For Intimate Portrait, I'm Meredith Vieira.